All right, live from beautiful downtown Southern Maryland, it's time for the Gears of Resistance, episode number 16 for Monday, October 12th, 2015. I think I got that right. Or is it 16? 15 or 16? Maybe it's episode 16. Who knows? Well, someone would know. Darn. Anyway, uh, we are a bi-weekly podcast dedicated to bringing you the latest and the greatest in open source hardware news, productivity hacks for business and aspiring makers, and uh, maybe even a couple electronics tips and tricks every now and then, or something like that. Anyway, um, back from hiatus, we did a Gears or Steam Power podcast last week. I don't know if this is supposed to be the week or if for now we got our schedules backwards now, but we'll fix that. Um, so I guess first thing to talk about this week, it's going to be a little bit of, um, not really a tech, it's going to be more of a productivity, um, when you're doing maker projects or even, you know, some, maybe some small side business electronics projects, we're going to give some advice. At least I'm going to tell you about how I have started to document my projects, um, and what I kind of put together to make a nice, neat package that I can deliver to clients and make that as painless as possible. Um, so with that, uh, got a couple things news, but the first let's share, we've started a, if I can figure this out. Let me share my screen here. Screen one, that looks good. Let's share that one. All right. So if you head over to the, uh, website. Let me make sure this is presenting to everybody. Um, you can sign up for um, our Slack channel. So um, gearsofresistance.com. There is a little uh, form. You type in your name. You're, we need an email address. Uh, let us know if you want to be a part of the uh, Steam Power Podcast community or the Gears of Resistance or both. And we'll go ahead and add you. We've got a few people already signed up in the, about the last week or so. We've had it running. So um, what is Slack? That's a great question. So it is a, uh, for those of us who grew up in the 90s and maybe even before, but mostly those of us who um, remember the 90s at least, um, and uh, AOL and, and chat rooms. Well, this is kind of like the 21st century um, version of um, chat rooms. Well, at least that's, if you don't take it to its full advantage, that's about what it is. Um, but it's way more powerful. So, um, we've set up a channel called gears of resistance. I think it's gears of resistance dot Um, and then inside there's different, uh, channels. So we've got like a how to a place for introductions, uh, projects, people to talk about the projects. Uh, we've set up a uh, private group for the Patreon folks, uh, if and when we ever get any, but I'll leave that alone. Um, there's some, um, you know, and, and you go in here and you, you can kind of, you know, chats like, hello. And if there's more people, um, you can kind of, and it's asynchronous. So you don't necessarily have to all be online at the same time. Um, so think of it kind of like email meets text messaging meets uh, chat rooms. But the other cool things is you can add these, there's these different service integrations. So you can add things like uh, Dropbox so that anytime you upload a Dropbox to a uh, file to a certain folder, everyone gets notified. Uh, GitHub, same thing. If you made a commit, you can, people can get notified without you having to go in there and manually type, hey, I've made a commit. So there's, Tons and tons of services that it, it inter, uh, integrates with uh, Google Drive, GitHub, Google Hangouts is the kind of the ones I've been using lately, but there's more, GoToMeeting, Heroku, um, IFTT, if this, then that, for those who don't know, which I've been playing with a lot lately too, uh, MailChimp. And uh, anyway, that is just a way, It's uh, so again, you can set this up to be configured that as certain actions happen on these services, um, you get notifications um, inside your, your channel of choice. And you can configure however you want. So it's pretty cool, pretty powerful. Um, there is mobile. The nice thing about it is um, there's mobile apps, there's tablet apps, uh, Android and iPhone. 
Um, and unlike the IRC channel, which we tried before, IRC is nice and it's great, um, but it kind of takes, again, a little tweaking to get it set up. And again, it's not as, as tightly integrated um, with all these other integrations you can do. So we're going to give this a try for a while and see how that works. Uh, and again, if you're interested, you can set up your own. It's all free up to, like I think, a certain number of users and certain number of messages. Um, then there's paid subscription models too. But for the most part, we're going to be playing on the uh, the uh, free version. And then again, over here, like so forever. And the nice thing with there's the apps um, that you can install on your desktop um, makes it easy to switch between. Like I got the Steam Power Podcast. I've got one for uh, my business, one for Gears of Resistance. You can toggle through your different um, communities pretty easily. All right, so that's Slack. Uh, let's see here. Some other tech news before we uh, get into the main thrust of today's episode. Um, uh, the chip computer, the nine dollar computer, uh, is now shipping. It's been um, it's going out to I guess their the alpha release people. They're going to help them, um, you know, check for bugs in the uh, in the code on the hardware, and then after that they'll. Uh, launch it out to their larger uh, Kickstarter community first, and then it'll go for um, for sale. We can just buy it off their website. So for those who don't remember, it was a uh, $9 computer that's basically the size of... Um, let me see if I can find a picture of it here. Let's see if we can... We'll mute them out. Let's see if we can find it. Where's Chip at? Where is Chip... There it is. So right down there, that's the chip computer. Um, looks like kind of like, you know, again, Beagle Bones slash Raspberry Pi. <laughs> Maybe a little bit smaller sized. Um, and of course, it, it runs going to uh, run a flavor of Linux. Um, the $9 version only gets you a composite video out. I think the composite video out is on board. <laughs> There was um, the equivalent of like the Arduino Shields or um, I don't forget what they're calling their version to add um, HDMI or um, what was the other thing they're adding? At? Was it uh, uh, VGA? Um, so if you want to have a more native, uh, not a more native, but a more traditional, I mean, very few people have. If they do, if their television does have the very few people now use the composite little yellow RCA cable. Uh, that's what comes default on board. But again, um, I think $13 or $14 additional um, gets you an HTMI shield, which then, okay, then it's not really a $9 computer. It's more like a $21 computer, which gets you closer to the price of a Raspberry Pi. But I think a Raspberry Pi still I think they're around 30 or 35 dollars um, last time I checked the, I, I did kick I, I kick started them um, my order it was still pending for February so I'm still I guess a couple months out um, according to the article here they had 40,000 backers so um, yeah that takes a while to get your production up and running um, especially when you're talking that even that that kind of scales one of those things where it's in between like you're not a huge product but you're not a small product either and i think that's probably challenging i would imagine to find someone who's you know yeah they want to deal with that quantity but maybe it's not enough to really get them good deals i don't know but you know at the end of the day they kick-started a nine dollar computer it's what they promised and it seems like they're being able to deliver it so um that's cool. Uh, next story. This one kind of, I haven't heard about this before. Um, and it was kind of cool that I just stumbled upon it. Um, so basically, uh, the folks that bring us AutoCAD, Autodesk, have uh, put out a open source, both hardware and software, uh, 3D printer. Um, and it's more than just a 3D printer. We'll get, back, we'll get into that in a little bit. So... Um, their 3D printer, they're calling it Ember, and then the software that runs it is called Spark. Um, 
and you know there was a lot of controversy because you know AutoCAD is not necessarily a open source product, and so people were questioning whether Autodesk was really committing. Um, but apparently, this has just dropped. So um, they they had it, they've announced it last year, but now they're finally getting around to again open sourcing all their uh, code and their hardware uh, design files. Uh, they're releasing it under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike license. Um, and um, so there it is. So this is, I guess, the uh, the Ember's main board. Um, looks like nothing too fancy. Um, little microcontroller board with the motors, uh, hardware all on board. A little bit of Ethernet there, a little, little bit of networking. So anyway, um, this says here, oh, it's, it's based on a version... Uh, a heavily modified version of the standard Beagle Bone Black. Um, and the cool thing about it is that it also works with their um, their their cloud-based CAD program called Fusion 360, which I played with a little bit um, a while ago, and I guess I should go back and play with it a little bit more now. Um, the cool thing about it is it includes some... Um, simulation capability so not only can you do the design and then do some and then print it out all within kind of one workflow um, there's also apparently some simulation capability and i will read exactly uh verbatim what it says on the website um it says now monthly subscribers will have the ability to perform linear stress test simulations and modal analysis users Users can define material properties, add constraints and stress loads, to test for weaknesses in their designs, all within the same software that the object was created in. Autodesk also plans to release a future update that will provide them thermal and fatigue analysis. Um, I'll go on. Simulation traditionally require, takes multiple software tools and hours of work, not so with Fusion 360. We made it powerful, but drop dead simple and by integrating simulation directly within the design and engineering workflow users can not only build more viable parts with fewer iterations but they can also uh, develop intuition and expertise to reach validation more quickly we see these up we see this update as a critical step in making fusion 316 the most innovative integrated platform developing products from concept all the way to fabrication uh, that was director of fusion 360 kevin schneider so it's a lot of Kai Cat layout tools, but the the simulation part kind of lags. Um, there is uh, Autodesk. I think it's it's Autodesk. One two three D design or one two yeah one two three D. Let's just go. Actually, let's go look it up. Oh, oh here we go. One, two, three D design. So, yeah, this does this calls from Autodesk, too. So, I had subscribed to this for a while. Um, stopped a little bit back, but maybe I'll get back, back on one. Um, let's see here. Do, 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 here it is. One, two, three D design. Oh, let's update it. Let's see what the new updates are. Uh, the simplest way to get your ideas into three D. Yep, 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 yep. What's where's the updates for the? Uh, Oh, I hit the right one, right? For the circuit design. Oh, wait, those one, two, three design. So one, two, three D circuits um, does have some um, Arduino simulation, both in terms of the hardware as well as the IDE. So you can drop your Arduino code in here um, and kind of perform some basic um, quote unquote simulation of your code and your circuit. If it uh, decides to uh, load, our internet has been really crappy here lately. So there you go. So there's a little Arduino micro, and doo -doo -doo -doo. 
you can there's the code editor so there's little code you can write and it'll actually run you hit start the simulation and there goes the led blinking in simulation world so yeah i think this kind of stuff you know, adding the simulation component um into any I think is probably one of the next big steps especially i hope so or the the electronics design and um especially for for unless it's you know first people that are doing her just starting off the arduinos the raspberry Pis, because it's a way it's another way to drive down the cost where you can do simulation uh, and practice without actually even buying the boards um even though it's really cool to have the boards and you know unfortunately fry them at any time the nice thing with having it in virtually if you fry it you can i guess reset it uh anyway so the nine dollar computer and then the uh the AutoCAD, the Autodesk uh, Ember. So take a look at those. We'll have show notes for those. Um, so let's get to the meat of today's discussion. And that is the extremely exciting topic of, um, but really, actually, it's really important. Um, project documentation, how you document your project, how you present your project, um, how to make it easy for clients once you're done, especially if you're in, again, um, if you're in, if you've got a little side business going, you're doing, you know, kind of light work, uh, circuit, you know, you don't want to do, make yourself more work documenting than it is actually to, to, to do the project, if that makes any sense. And then if you're a maker and you're trying to get your idea shared with folks, um, same thing, you want to spend more time having fun actually building and tweaking and whatnot versus documenting. But for people to really be able to latch onto an idea, they have to be able to understand it. So that's where good documentation is comes in. And this is where I claim not to be an expert yet. I'm still tweaking my own internal uh, ideology on how to do it good, better, best. Um, so again, I'll open up. Here's how I'm doing it. It probably could be done better, and I'd appreciate people sharing their ideas. So here's one project I'm working on. It's a little photon-based um, data logger that's capturing um, ambient light and temperature. And then I'm going to radio that back um, to like a Google Docs or something like that. Using, I think, yeah, we'll use IFTT, I think. So um, here's, again, I'm using the GitHub as kind of... branching the committing the swinging back and forth the forking and all the other stuff that i know it can do that i i'm slowly trying to appreciate and understand but for me it's kind of a way just to have one place to put all the files so i used to i used to group my documents by um the application that edited it so edited it edited it yeah so for instance um I would keep all my Eagle files in the Eagle folder. I would keep all my um, um, 3D models in SketchUp or whatever I was using at the time. And while that's great from finding, you know, when you're in an application, file open, if you stay consistent, it's really easy to get all to your all your different files. But from a project perspective, it's a pain in the butt. So first recommendation is... Um, for me, I create a, I have a GitHub repository folder that all my projects then get a subfolder under there named something like Photon Environmental Data Logger. Um, and then I put all the files that are related um, across whatever application they're, they're com um, uh, written with in that folder. So for instance, my 3D design, I have a 3D design fossil uh, oh, that got bigger there. So under my Photon Environmental Data Logger folder, I have the 3D Design folder, which contains the uh, STL file and the SketchUp file. The cool thing about, I guess, for people that don't know, for with um, GitHub, there is a uh, web-based 
um, STL folder uh, viewer. So if you put an STL file up there, you can uh, play around and uh, 3D uh, drag around the model. Uh, just in case you didn't know. Uh, so that's one folder I have. So most everything I do, even circuit boards, I'll um, like with Eagle. Um, there is a um, ULP that you can run that takes uh, your board design and uh, dumps it out as a um, file that then you install a third-party um, um, piece of code in SketchUp that then takes that file that Eagle generates um, and then creates a 3D model based on it. And then you can play with it in there. So a lot of times, for instance, <clears throat> I'm trying to figure out, um, you know, I'm going to build a, a, a case or an enclosure for a project. I import the, um, the PCB and then I have a real accurate way of knowing how big that, um, um, board is going to be now sometimes it doesn't always put the um, every component doesn't necessarily get uh, created so sometimes you got to kind of draw um, like for instance if a resistor is missing or a switch is missing um, you can draw that in then group it together and then again you have one nice cool file to go build your enclosure based off of uh, I'm going to save documentation so let's that's the 3d design file folder I'm going to save documentation for the end because it'll make a little bit more sense. Uh, an eagle file. Um, again, I have the board and the schematic files. Um, eagle up again. That's the um, if you're using the eagle up app to create a SketchUp model of your circuit board, uh, this is where the fold. This is where those files get made at. And then <clears throat> uh, I create a folder for Gerber files inside the eagle folder. And when I run the CAM processor, I dump the Gerber files into here. Uh, then the software, I probably should create one software folder and then put all the other things. But um, So I have like the Photon cert firmware, so the actual code that's going to run on the Photon. I've put, so I make a, a firmware folder. And then in this case, it has um, Node.js server side stuff. So I, I make those a separate folder. Um, just a way, again, cleaning up. I mean, it's all about, you know, either you're going to give this to a client or you're going to come back to this in a year, two years, three years, and you're going to try to remember what the heck did I do. Um, so trying to keep it as clean as possible um, and giving things as... Don't you know? Don't try to get too tricky with the file names. Give things um, a file name that makes sense. That if you were to look at this five years from now, it would make sense to you. Um, <clears throat> of course, there's the README and the README. I put um, any links to third-party stuff. So like um, either like for instance, uh, let's see here. So anything I use to learn about these parts. So I'm again, I'm using a little. <laughs> light sensor and I'm using a temperature sensor I create the I uh, put the links to kind of their data sheets in the readme I also um, for client work sometimes what I'll do is let me see make sure this is the right one um, with like if I work with like buying parts from mouser I'll create a um, a shopping cart with all the parts in it so people can just go buy the parts without having to add to the shopping cart manually themselves. They can just hit one link. There's a pre-built shopping cart they can just check out with all the parts they need. Um, and then, uh, let's see here, Osh Park. So um, a lot of times, make the board. Again, uh, this is all going to be open source. People are going to do this themselves if they so choose. Um, throw the board up into Osh Park and you can get a permanent link that the people can go back and just buy your board. Um, so that's another option. Or another thing that, again, I keep that on the readme file because these are the things that people, you know, ordering parts, ordering the board, they don't want to drill down 30,000 different um, links or folders to find this kind of information plus the links on the um, 
the spec sheets. Try to keep those in the readme file. So then what's in the documentation folder? So um, this is where I create, so for every, every Eagle file I do, um, every board, every schematic, every 3D model of a part, I will do screen captures of it because not everyone will have access to the either Eagle or SketchUp, but everyone, almost every computer, every operating system knows how to handle like JPEG or PNG files. So as much as I can, um, and as much as I can remember, um, take screen captures of everything you do because if nothing else, that'll be the lowest common denominator that everybody can read. So for instance, um, here's a little look at the board. Um, that's uh, without it being pre-populated. Oh, that's from the bottom. Um, and then again, here's the schematic. Again, nothing too fancy with this one. And then the board itself. Again, just so that people who don't have access to Eagle or whatever um, application can still see kind of what the end result looks like. And then the last thing, of course, is a bill of materials. I prefer an Excel format just because a lot of the, you know, um, the fabs and a lot of the um, manufacturing houses, um, they, can, they can open up an Excel. Um, <clears throat> And what else? What else would I put in here? Oh, a readme, like or a project documentation. So, um, one habit I try to get into is writing, um, writing a report, sort of like imagine you were back in if you if you were so fortunate or unfortunate, I don't know these days and age, um, to go to college for engineering, um, and you did projects, especially like if you did a capstone project, you had to really document your project. I tried to do the same thing. For all my projects, I try to do a nice write-up. Again, if nobody else is for me, when I want to, I have an idea for a a sort of similar project, but five years from now, and I can say, oh, I remember I did something similar, um, and I can repurpose that project. I like to be able to go back and kind of read um, what I did before because it makes it a lot easier to build something a little bit faster next time. I haven't done it for this project yet, but to give you an idea, of what I'm talking about, some of the stuff that when I write projects for Mauser, um, we put together again a little website for that specific project that people can just walk through. Um, so that'll give you an idea of what kind of documentation it doesn't have. It doesn't. You're not writing War and Peace. You're not writing, you know, your dissertation. Just enough of a project documentation and written in a way that's kind of almost like you know, yeah, it's like reading a book. Um, really, really does help jog the memory later on. Plus, if again, if you're going to share these projects with other people or a client, it um, it really works well. Um, I'm trying to think if that's anything else I put in there. That's pretty much it. Um, I will highlight two, uh, one other thing, uh, or two other things. Uh, so we've talked about GitHub. There is... Uh, a competitor now called GitLab, which um, is um, saying they're going to offer free hosting for pri private repositories um, with unlimited repos and collaborators if you store it on their server. Um, <clears throat> they also have the ability to um, take their code and run it on your own server. And they have an enterprise edition that has, I guess, additional features and support. And that's how they're making money off of it, <clears throat> I guess, is selling the more. If you're going to run it on your own servers, um, they have a little bit more peace of mind or security. And to get all the whiz-bang features, um, you can pay that way. Um, I haven't, I've, I've signed up for an account. I haven't really used it yet. So I'm not sure how much different it is from GitHub. I'm assuming that it's, again, because these are both Git-based, that once you know one, it's not too much of a stretch to learn the other. Um, it may be just a, you know, a couple different things that are not necessarily Git-specific that might change. Um, but if you're interested and you want free private repos um, that you can't get on GitHub, then maybe check out GitLab. 
Um, oh, and one last thing, I guess, is um, how I do my... Um, so we talked about the project documentation after you're done the project. Um, just wanted to point out using Git, um, or excuse me, Evernote, is kind of my preferred um, tools when I'm actually doing the homework and studying leading up to a project. So as I'm out surfing the web, getting project ideas or getting ideas on, on how to use components, um, I'm really liking Evernote as my kind of, uh, well, notebook um, for project ideas. It's worked out really well. Um, I like the fact that you can... Uh, install a little extension into Chrome, and with one click, you can export a web page and it dumps it into Evernote. Um, and then you can create your own folders and, and you know, kind of like one notebook per project, and then a general learning project for or a general folder to kind of just for things you're learning in general that you don't necessarily have a specific project for. So, I wanted to point that out. Um, if people are looking for ways to do their documentation, um, I'm liking Evernote. Uh, again, for the kind of the homework phase of a project. All right. I think that's it. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah, that is going to wrap it up for this week. Um, nothing, again, crazy technical, um, but uh, maybe a little bit more on productivity. And uh, if nothing else, um, you've seen how I'm doing it. And if you've got any recommendations on things to try to things that work for you uh, that I could incorporate, or if you've got more advice on how you set up your project documentation folders, um, I would love, love, love to get some more advice and some good ideas. Cause this has kind of been what I've learned from trial by error uh, or error by trial or something like that. Um, <clears throat> And I think I'm, I'm pretty sure there's probably better ways to do it. One la oh, one last thing. Um, I just picked this up uh, the other day at Lowe's. And you're probably not going to be able to see it because it's clear. It's already getting a little nasty. But um, sheets of Lexon. It's uh, like 2 or $3 a sheet for an 8x10 sheet. Um, but the nice thing is you can write, if you can kind of tell, you can write on it with dry erase marker. So I've got about four or five of these sitting on my uh, lab desk here. And so if I'm working on something, and instead of having to like go find a piece of paper, I just have my little dry erase mark right here with an arm's length, and I can write down um, a real quick note, maybe a formula, or try to you know calculate something real quick. So these little Lexon sheets, there's bigger ones. <coughs> um, I, the reason I went with the smaller form factor, these little and did a lot of them, um, was because I my thinking was twofold. A, um, the prices for the larger ones are a little crazy. Like it's like two or three dollars for a small sheet, but then it's like the next size up, which is like um, twenty four by eighteen, was like forty dollars. So I'm not sure why there's such a big price for the log the bigger uh, larger sheets. Um, but the other thing I was thinking was, um, instead of having one massive sheet, if I work on something and I want to take it somewhere, you know, over to like my uh, my router or whatever, um, I, the smaller sheets I could do a lot more modular stuff. So um, that was the thinking. So uh, Lexon, four dollars to two to three dollars. There's some other cheaper ones uh, too. Something called Optics or Optex. Um, so try those out. If you're looking for kind of like a clear dry erase board, uh, that you can put right down on your, uh, your desktop, your lab bench, these seem to work pretty well. All right. So with that, head over to gearsresistance.com, sign up for the Slack channel. Um, that's where people can kind of communicate and build a community and I'll talk together about everything that's great and awesome about open source hardware and uh, making and maybe even running a business or starting up a business based on open source hardware. So um, anything else? I think that's it. So leave us a note, visit the website, give us good ideas. How can I improve my, uh, how I'm doing my project documentation? I'd love to hear people's advice and tips and tricks out there. So with that, until next time, thank you all very, very, very much for listening and or watching. And until next time, stay quirky.
I think I'm going to eventually get this right. Um, thanks for watching.